battalion left the task force area in the 24th of January on Operation Coburg. Now, we knew that this was going to be uh, a longer operation and therefore it would go over the Tet period. The main role of our battalion uh, during Operation Coburg was to prevent the movement of the NBA down to the Long Bin area to destroy the infrastructure there. It was apparent that there was no VC uh, in the area and they were all NBA and they didn't know the area because uh, they were North Vietnamese coming down through from Cambodia. The platoon would go out early in the morning, lay up for an ambush, put it alongside a track, wait for the NVA to come along. We'd have a shoot up uh, and we'd uh, stop for lunch and uh, then get ready and have another one in the afternoon. Probably the closest call I had, had this feeling I was being watched. I slowly turned my head to the left and uh, there's this chap, uh, North Vietnamese, about six feet away, looking through the jungle trying to find us. And uh, all of a sudden our eyes locked onto one another and uh, I beat him to the draw, and uh, that was that. Second Tet Offensive, now commonly called by all historians, the Battle for Saigon was incredibly important because number one, it allowed them to have more leverage at the Paris Peace Talks, and number two, it was meant to give uh, a birthday present for Ho Chi Minh. For most of the civilian population, this was more of the same and not unexpected. Keep in mind that over half of Saigon's population had come already as refugees from the country areas, and Saigon was supposed to be safe. It wasn't. It was just more despair for them. obvious to us that uh, the attack had started in Cholon. We drove northwards uh, towards Cholon uh, in the Minimoak, and I must say in defence of uh, foreign correspondence, that was a very unusual thing for uh, five of us to be in one jeep. Uh, we drove into the VEC back lines. They didn't attack us. We, we drove into uh, a fairly natural ambush. They poured 10 seconds of automatic rounds over, above, around, and through that jeep. And when they saw that we were not armed, I'm sure that they felt that they knew they'd made a mistake. I then think they took fright and uh, decided to finish us off. It was Michael Birch of the Associated Press of Australia. Shouted out, pleading, desperately, bow she, bow she. He stopped, that is, the commander stopped, and he said, very derisively, well, hell, thou chief, and he just shot. While he was reloading, that's I took the opportunity to jump up and to uh, run in a zigzag way and to uh, escape. We were part of the... Uh surgical team that was selected from the Royal Brisbane Hospital contingent. We were sent to the Benoit Civilian Hospital and we were given the surgical suite. We were treating the civilian population who were mainly casualties of war and the work, my belief, was band-aiding. A lot of us felt that we were Australians' conscience being there and that the stuff we were doing was patch-up, band-aid work and we knew that we were sending these people back out into a situation where they had poor food and poor hygiene, no clean water, and where there are accidents and warfare, and it felt like we were starting at the wrong end. I'll never forget um, the faith of these people. There was an acceptance of what was happening. We had a surgeon who was very good at hair lips and he did lots of hair lip surgery while he was there and it was really quite gratifying because you could see that we were doing hair lips for people and everyone was so glad to uh, have the surgery done. That was good. They came from the mountains, they came from the surrounding villages, they came from the marketplaces and we would often know that they were coming in very often with abdominal wounds, with their intestines, you know, exposed. Um, a leg blown off was very common. 
eye injuries, facial injuries, etc. It was just like MASH. I mean, the, the, the trick about MASH is that it interpolates humour with really serious tragedy, and that's what this was like. We were half hysterical half the time. I suppose the worst little patch of things I can remember is uh, there were about a dozen people who got napalmed, and that was terrible. We had nowhere to put them and nowhere to treat them, and they just died one after the other. And we saved, I think, two of them, and it was awful just having to watch them all die. Some of the team went over as doves and some went over as hawks. And those were the expressions used then about people who were pro-war or anti-war. And it was curious that no one appeared to change. Over the time we were there, everyone who was a hawk stayed a hawk and everyone who was a dove stayed a dove. I was a dove. I shall not seek and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. It's an honour to meet men doing the job they have to do as well as you are doing it. And it's an encouragement to meet men doing a job which is of such importance to their nation now and in the future. Some armoured vehicles were moving up the road and were fired on for some unknown reason by enemy in the village of Binbar. So the task force commander then uh, got me to take my whole battalion up there and the uh, following two days uh, was almost a continuous battle. We moved up to the road near the village and we were fired upon with uh, heavy fire from RPGs which caused us to swing across the road into the open ground. The district chief and I went up in a helicopter and he broadcast in Vietnamese uh, warning both the enemy and any civilians who may have been there to clear out that an attack was about to take place. The infantry had uh, moved up with us and were riding in the back of the armed personnel carriers and they uh, took up position behind us, ready for us to sweep into the village and start clearing. inside houses and inside bunkers underneath the houses. I, I put one man at the doorway for protection and I went into the house and proceeded to search the house. As I lifted up the uh, double bed that was in one of the rooms, there were two enemy soldiers underneath the bed. You can't be prepared for that sort of uh, action. As we drove through the village, RPG was fired at us and struck the side of the tank and wounded the turret crew. We abandoned the tank and left it, moved out to a point where a chopper flew in to take us out. Thought I had a larger wound in my back, which just turned out to be a heat, a heat blast. I didn't get on the chopper at that stage. I uh, told my wife I had a nice, safe job in Nui Dat, and as soon as you get on a chopper, there's a wound in action telegram sent, and she was worried enough without getting something like that. I think the NVA were uh, scared of the tanks until Bin Bar and for some reason uh, they decided they would stay and have a go. I'm sure they regret it very much now. What happened after the, uh, the battle was over, that uh, we tried to repair the villages as much as we possibly could. Well, the civil affairs representatives, including myself, went into the village of Bingbar the day after the battle to inspect the village to see what damage had been done. We made an assessment of the damage with a view to determining what sort of materials and what sort of work was necessary to make the buildings habitable again. So this sort of situation of relocation provided a good opportunity for the Viet Cong to exploit the resentment of the people which um, resulted from this relocation. To protect our men who are in Vietnam and to guarantee the continued success of our withdrawal and Vietnamization programs, I have concluded that the time has come for action. This is not an invasion of Cambodia. I thought they were a pack of rat bags, you know, university bludgers who 
didn't know what they're on about. Uh, we were there to do the job that, that we'd been trained to do. And to that extent, the uh, protest movement was uh, an irritation and nothing more to us. I felt their actions were very un-Australian. And uh, one didn't really have much time to analyse why uh, people felt as they did. And we just got on with the job. was flourishing, movement on the roads, the markets were open. It was as if there was no war at all by the time the task force were leaving. It was pointless, the Australians remaining, because the task force really had nothing more to do in Fulkley province. There were no enemy. Well, it was still hot, but we didn't have three weeks off before we came home. We just on a plane and back, and we just come out the jungle. I'm very pleased that I went there, but I certainly was glad to get home, particularly coming home unscathed. I was one of the lucky ones because I went over, came back the same way as I went over. I had a daughter at that stage. She was nine months old that I'd never seen. They arrived, they dispersed, and that was it. We really didn't sit down and talk about Vietnam. We talked about the future. Vietnam was the most interesting most frightening, most irritating, and most addictive time of that part of my life. Every single day that goes past, something relating to Vietnam comes to mind. Uh, there's, no, there's no change in that, and there's no turning back from it. And some of them that had lost their only sons. I was quite lucky in a way because I had others. I'm aware the casualties of the war just don't happen on the battlefield. They, it's, uh, it's an ongoing thing and uh, certainly a lot of people are having problems which are still coming out today. I thought the protesters were a pack of bludgers, protesting, not knowing what they were doing, but then I soon realised that uh, they were right and I think we were wrong. I don't think as a war it was any more sick than any other war that Australian soldiers have fought in. Uh, let's hope we never involve ourselves in another fiasco like that one. I don't have any regrets whatsoever, none whatsoever. My only regret perhaps would be that I had to come home a little bit early. <laughs> We were a bit like a boat moving through the water. We created a wake, but when we moved on, the water settled down and all was as before. <laughs>